Chapter 32, Part 2 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Mayoff. The bold satirist who has indulged his discontent by the partial and passionate censure of the Christian emperors violates the dignity rather than the truth of history by comparing the son of Theodosius to one of those harmless and simple animals who scarcely feel that they are the property of their shepherd. Two passions, however, fear and conjugal affection, awaken the languid soul of Arcadius. He was terrified by the threats of a victorious barbarian, and he yielded to the tender eloquence of his wife, Eudoxia, who, with a flood of artificial tears, presenting her infant children to their father, implored his justice for some real or imaginary insult, which she imputed to the audacious eunuch. The emperor's hand was directed to sign the condemnation of Eutropius, the magic spell which during four years had bound the prince and the people, was instantly dissolved and the acclamations that so lately hailed the merit and fortune of the favorite were converted into the clamors of the soldiers and people who reproached his crimes and pressed his immediate execution. In this hour of distress and despair, his only refuge was in the sanctuary of the church, whose privileges he had wisely or profanely attempted to circumscribe, and the most eloquent of the saints, John Chrysostom, enjoyed the triumph of protecting a prostrate minister, whose choice had raised him to the ecclesiastical throne of Constantinople. The archbishop, descending the pulpit of the cathedral, that he might be distinctly seen and heard by an innumerable crowd of either sex and of every age, pronounced a seasonable and pathetic discourse on the forgiveness of injuries and the instability of human greatness. The agonies of the pale and affrighted wretch who lay groveling under the table of the altar, exhibited a solemn and instructive spectacle, and the orator, who was afterwards accused of insulting the misfortunes of Eutropius, labored to excite the contempt that he might assuage the fury of the people. The powers of humanity, of superstition, and of eloquence prevailed. The empress, Eudoxia, was restrained by her own prejudices, or by those of her subjects, from violating the sanctuary of the church, and Eutropius was tempted to capitulate by the milder arts of persuasion, and by an oath, that his life should be spared. Careless of the dignity of their sovereign, the new ministers of the palace immediately published an edict to declare that his late favorite had disgraced the names of consul and patrician to abolish his statues, to confiscate his wealth, and to inflict a perpetual exile in the island of Cyprus. A despicable and decrepit eunuch could no longer alarm the fears of his enemies, nor was he capable of enjoying what yet remained the comforts of peace, of solitude, and of a happy climate. But their implacable revenge still envied him the last moments of a miserable life, and Eutropius had no sooner touched the shores of Cyprus than he was hastily recalled. The vain hope of eluding, by a change of place, the obligation of an oath, engaged the empress to transfer the scene of his trial and execution from Constantinople to the adjacent suburb of Chalcedon. The consul Aurelian pronounced the sentence, and the motives of that sentence exposed the jurisprudence of a despotic government. The crimes which Eutropius had committed against the people might have justified his death. But he was found guilty of harnessing to his charnet the sacred animals who, from their breed or color, were reserved for the use of the emperor alone. While this domestic revolution was transacted, Gainus openly revolted from his allegiance, united his forces at Thetira in Lydia with those of Tribigild, and still maintained his superior ascendant over the rebellious leader of the Ostrogoths. The confederate armies advanced, without resistance, to the straits of the Hellespont and the Bosphorus, and Arcadius was instructed to prevent the loss of his Asiatic dominions by resigning his authority and his person to the faith of the barbarians. The church of the holy martyr Euphemia, situate on a lofty eminence near Chalcedon, 
was chosen for the place of the interview. Gainas bowed with reverence at the feet of the emperor, whilst he required the sacrifice of Aurelian and Saturninus, two ministers of consular rank, and their naked necks were exposed by the haughty rebel to the edge of the sword, till he condescended to grant them a precarious and disgraceful respite. The Goths, according to the terms of the agreement, were immediately transported from Asia into Europe, and their victorious chief, who accepted the title of Master General of the Roman Armies, soon filled Constantinople with his troops, and distributed among his dependents the honors and rewards of the empire. In his early youth, Gainas had passed the Danube as a suppliant and a fugitive. His elevation had been the work of valor and fortune, and his indiscreet or perfidious conduct was the cause of his rapid downfall. Notwithstanding the vigorous opposition of the archbishop, he importunately claimed for his Arian sectaries the possession of a peculiar church, and the pride of the Catholics was offended by the public toleration of heresy. Every quarter of Constantinople was filled with tumult and disorder, and the barbarians gazed with such ardor on the rich shops of the jewelers and the tables of the bankers, which were covered with gold and silver, that it was judged prudent to remove those dangerous temptations from their sight. They resented the injurious precaution, and some alarming attempts were made during the night to attack and destroy with fire the imperial palace. In this state of mutual and suspicious hostility, the guards and the people of Constantinople shut the gates, and rose in arms to prevent or to punish the conspiracy of the Goths. During the absence of Gainas, his troops were surprised and oppressed. Seven thousand barbarians perished in this bloody massacre. In the fury of the pursuit, the Catholics uncovered the roof and continued to throw down flaming logs of wood till they overwhelmed their adversaries who had retreated to the church or conventicle of the Arians. Gainas was either innocent of the design or too confident of his success. He was astonished by the intelligence that the flower of his army had been ingloriously destroyed, that he himself was declared a public enemy, and that his countryman, Fravita, a brave and loyal confederate, had assumed the management of the war by sea and land. The enterprises of the rebel against the cities of Thrace were encountered by a firm and well-ordered defense. His hungry soldiers were soon reduced to the grass that grew on the margin of the fortifications. And Gainas, who vainly regretted the wealth and luxury of Asia, embraced a desperate resolution of forcing the passage of the Hellespont. He was destitute of vessels, but the woods of the Chersonesus afforded materials for rafts, and his intrepid barbarians did not refuse to trust themselves to the waves. But Fravita attentively watched the progress of their undertaking. As soon as they had gained the middle of the stream, the Roman galleys, impelled by the full force of oars of the current and of a favorable wind, rushed forwards in compact order and with irresistible weight, and the Hellespont was covered with the fragments of the Gothic shipwreck. After the destruction of his hopes and the loss of many thousands of his bravest soldiers, Gainas, who could no longer aspire to govern or to subdue the Romans, determined to resume the independence of a savage life. A light and active body of barbarian horse, disengaged from their infantry and baggage, might perform in eight or ten days a march of three hundred miles from the Hellespont to the Danube. The garrisons of that important frontier had been gradually annihilated. The river, in the month of December, would be deeply frozen, and the unbounded prospect of Scythia was opened to the ambition of Gainas. This design was secretly communicated to the national troops, who devoted themselves to the fortunes of their leader, and before the signal of departure was given, a great number of provincial auxiliaries, whom he suspected of an attachment to their native country, were perfidiously massacred. The Goths advanced by rapid marches through the plains of Thrace, and they were soon delivered from the fear of a pursuit by the vanity of Fravita, who, instead of extinguishing the war, hastened to enjoy the popular applause and to assume the peaceful honors of the consulship. But a formidable ally appeared in arms to vindicate the majesty of the empire, 
and to guard the peace and liberty of Scythia. The superior forces of Alden, king of the Huns, opposed the progress of Gainus. A hostile and ruined country prohibited his retreat. He disdained to capitulate, and after repeatedly attempting to cut his way through the ranks of the enemy, he was slain with his desperate followers at the field of battle. Eleven days after the naval victory of the Hellespont, the head of Gainus, the inestimable gift of the conqueror, was received at Constantinople with the most liberal expressions of gratitude, and the public deliverance was celebrated by festivals and illuminations. The triumphs of Arcadius became the subject of epic poems, and the monarch, no longer oppressed by any hostile terrors, resigned himself to the mild and absolute dominion of his wife, the fair and artful Eudoxia, who has sullied her fame by the persecution of St. John Chrysostom. After the death of the indolent Nectarius, the successor of Gregory Nazianzen, the Church of Constantinople was distracted by the ambition of rival candidates, who were not ashamed to solicit with gold or flattery the suffrage of the people or of the favorite. On this occasion, Eutropius seems to have deviated from his ordinary maxims, and his uncorrupted judgment was determined only by the superior merit of a stranger. In a late journey to the east, he had admired the sermons of John, a native and presbyter of Antioch, whose name has been distinguished by the epithet of Chrysostom, or the Golden Mouth. A private order was despatched to the governor of Syria, and as the people might be unwilling to resign their favorite preacher, he was transported with speed and secrecy in a post-chariot from Antioch to Constantinople. The unanimous and unsolicited consent of the court, the clergy, and the people ratified the choice of the minister. And both as a saint and as an orator, the new archbishop surpassed the sanguine expectations of the public. Born of a noble and opulent family, in the capital of Syria, Chrysostom had been educated by the care of a tender mother under the tuition of the most skillful masters. He studied the art of rhetoric in the school of Libanius, and that celebrated sophist who soon discovered the talents of his disciple ingenuously confessed that John would have deserved to succeed him had he not been stolen away by the Christians. His piety soon disposed him to receive the sacrament of baptism, to renounce the lucrative and honorable profession of the law, and to bury himself in the adjacent desert, where he subdued the lusts of the flesh by an austere penance of six years. His infirmities compelled him to return to the society of mankind, and the authority of Miletius devoted his talents to the service of the church. But in the midst of his family, and afterwards on the archiepiscopal throne, Chrysostom still persevered in the practice of the monastic virtues. The ample revenues, which his predecessors had consumed in pomp and luxury, he diligently applied to the establishment of hospitals, and the multitudes, who were supported by his charity, preferred the eloquent and edifying discourses of their archbishop to the amusements of the theater or the circus. The monuments of that eloquence, which was admired near twenty years at Antioch and Constantinople, have been carefully preserved, and the possession of near one thousand sermons or homilies has authorized the critics of succeeding times to appreciate the genuine merit of Chrysostom. They unanimously attribute to the Christian orator the free command of an elegant and copious language the judgment to conceal the advantages which he derived from the knowledge of rhetoric and philosophy, an inexhaustible fund of metaphors and similitudes of ideas and images, to vary and illustrate the most familiar topics, the happy art of engaging the passions in the service of virtue and of exposing the folly, as well as the turpitude of vice, almost with the truth and spirit of a dramatic representation." The pastoral labors of the Archbishop of Constantinople provoked and gradually united against him two sorts of enemies, the aspiring clergy, who envied his success, and the obstinate sinners, who were offended by his reproofs. When Chrysostom thundered from the pulpit of St. Sophia against the degeneracy of the Christians, his shafts were spent among the crowd without wounding or even marking the character of any individual. When he declaimed against the peculiar vices of the rich, 
the poverty might obtain a transient consolation from his invectives, but the guilty were still sheltered by their numbers, and the reproach itself was dignified by some ideas of superiority and enjoyment. But as the pyramid rose towards the summit, it insensibly diminished to a point, and the magistrates, the ministers, the favored eunuchs, the ladies of the court, the Empress Eudoxia herself, had a much larger share of guilt to divide among a smaller proportion of criminals. The personal applications of the audience were anticipated or confirmed by the testimony of their own conscience, and the intrepid preacher assumed the dangerous right of exposing both the offense and the offender to the public abhorrence. The secret resentment of the court encouraged the discontent of the clergy and monks of Constantinople, who were too hastily reformed by the fervent zeal of their archbishop. He had condemned from the pulpit the domestic females of the clergy of Constantinople, who, under the name of servants or sisters, afforded a perpetual occasion either of sin or of scandal. The silent and solitary ascetics, who had secluded themselves from the world, were entitled to the warmest approbation of Chrysostom. But he despised and stigmatized, as the disgrace of their holy profession, the crowd of degenerate monks, who, from some unworthy motives of pleasure or profit, so frequently infested the streets of the capital. To the voice of persuasion, the archbishop was obliged to add the terrors of authority, and his ardor, in the exercise of ecclesiastical jurisdiction, was not always exempt from passion, nor was it always guided by prudence. Chrysostom was naturally of a choleric disposition, although he struggled, according to the precepts of the gospel, to love his private enemies, he indulged himself in the privilege of hating the enemies of God and of the church, and his sentiments were sometimes delivered with too much energy of countenance and expression. He still maintained, from some considerations of health or abstinence, his former habits of taking his repasts alone, and this inhospitable custom, which his enemies imputed to pride, contributed at least to nourish the infirmity of a morose and unsocial humor. Separated from that familiar intercourse which facilitates the knowledge and the despatch of business, he reposed an unsuspecting confidence in his deacon Serapion, and seldom applied his speculative knowledge of human nature to the particular character either of his dependents or of his equals. Conscious of the purity of his intentions, and perhaps of the superiority of his genius, the Archbishop of Constantinople extended the jurisdiction of the imperial city, that he might enlarge the sphere of his pastoral labors. And the conduct which the profane imputed to an ambitious motive appeared to Chrysostom himself in the light of a sacred and indispensable duty. In his visitation through the Asiatic provinces, he deposed thirteen bishops of Lydia and Phrygia, and indiscreetly declared that a deep corruption of simony and licentiousness had infected the whole episcopal order. If those bishops were innocent, such a rash and unjust condemnation must excite a well-grounded discontent. If they were guilty, the numerous associates of their guilt would soon discover that their own safety depended on the ruin of the archbishop, whom they studied to represent as the tyrant of the Eastern Church. This ecclesiastical conspiracy was managed by Theophilus, Archbishop of Alexandria, an active and ambitious prelate who displayed the fruits of rapine in monuments of ostentation. His national dislike to the rising greatness of a city which degraded him from the second to the third rank in the Christian world was exasperated by some personal dispute with Chrysostom himself. By the private invitation of the Empress, Theophilus landed at Constantinople with a stout body of Egyptian mariners to encounter the populace, and a train of dependent bishops to secure, by their voices, the majority of a synod. The synod was convened in the suburb of Chalcedon, surnamed the Oak, where Rufinus had erected a stately church and monastery, and their proceedings were continued during fourteen days, or sessions. A bishop and a deacon accused the archbishop of Constantinople, but the frivolous or improbable nature of the forty-seven articles which they presented against him may justly be considered as a fair and unexceptionable panegyric. 
Four successive summons were signified to Chrysostom, but he still refused to trust either his person or his reputation in the hands of his implacable enemies, who, prudently declining the examination of any particular charges, condemned his contumacious disobedience and hastily pronounced a sentence of deposition. The Synod of the Oak immediately addressed the Emperor to ratify and execute their judgment, and charitably insinuated that the penalties of treason might be inflicted on the audacious preacher who had reviled, under the name of Jezebel, the Empress Eudoxia herself. The Archbishop was rudely arrested and conducted through the city by one of the imperial messengers who landed him after a short navigation near the entrance of the Euxine, from whence, before the expiration of two days, he was gloriously recalled. <clears throat> The first astonishment of his faithful people had been mute and passive. They suddenly rose with unanimous and irresistible fury. Theophilus escaped, but the promiscuous crowd of monks and Egyptian mariners was slaughtered without pity in the streets of Constantinople. A seasonable earthquake justified the interposition of heaven, the torrent of sedition rolled forwards by the gates of the palace, and the empress, agitated by fear or remorse, threw herself at the feet of Arcadius, and confessed that the public safety could be purchased only by the restoration of Chrysostom. The Bosphorus was covered with innumerable vessels, the shores of Europe and Asia were profusely illuminated, and the acclamations of a victorious people accompanied, from the port to the cathedral, the triumph of the archbishop, who, too easily, consented to resume the exercise of his functions before his sentence had been legally reversed by the authority of an ecclesiastical synod. Ignorant or careless of the impending danger, Chrysostom indulged his zeal, or perhaps his resentment, declaimed with peculiar asperity against female vices, and condemned the profane honors which were addressed, almost in the precincts of St. Sophia, to the statue of the Empress. His imprudence tempted his enemies to inflame the haughty spirit of Eudoxia by reporting, or perhaps inventing, the famous exordium of a sermon. Herodias is again furious. Herodias again dances. She once more requires the head of John, an insolent illusion which, as a woman and a sovereign, it was impossible for her to forgive. The short interval of a perfidious truce was employed to concert more effectual measures for the disgrace and ruin of the archbishop. A numerous council of the eastern prelates, who were guided from a distance by the advice of Theophilus, confirmed the validity, without examining the justice, of the former sentence, and a detachment of barbarian troops was introduced into the city to suppress the emotions of the people. On the vigil of Easter, the solemn administration of baptism was rudely interrupted by the soldiers, who alarmed the modesty of the naked catechumens, and violated by their presence the awful mysteries of the Christian worship. Arsatius occupied the church of St. Sophia and the archiepiscopal throne. The Catholics retreated to the baths of Constantine, and afterwards to the fields, where they were still pursued and insulted by the guards, the bishops, and the magistrates. The fatal day of the second and final exile of Chrysostom was marked by the conflagration of the cathedral, of the senate house, and the adjacent buildings, and this calamity was imputed without proof, but not without probability, to the despair of a persecuted faction. Cicero might claim some merit if his voluntary banishment preserved the peace of the Republic, but the submission of Chrysostom was the indispensable duty of a Christian and a subject. Instead of listening to his humble prayer that he might be permitted to reside at Cyzicus or Necomedia, the inflexible empress assigned for his exile the remote and desolate town of Cucusus among the ridges of Mount Taurus in the Lesser Armenia. A secret hope was entertained that the archbishop might perish in a difficult and dangerous march of seventy days in the heat of summer through the provinces of Asia Minor, where he was continually threatened by the hostile attacks of the Isaurians and the more implacable fury of the monks. Yet Chrysostom arrived in safety at the palace of his confinement, and the three years which he spent at Cucusus and the neighboring town of Arabissus 
were the last and most glorious of his life. His character was consecrated by absence and persecution. The faults of his administration were no longer remembered, but every tongue repeated the praises of his genius and virtue. And the respectful attention of the Christian world was fixed on a desert spot among the mountains of Taurus. From that solitude the archbishop, whose active mind was invigorated by misfortunes, maintained a strict and frequent correspondence with the most distant provinces, exhorted the separate congregation of his faithful adherents to persevere in their allegiance, urged the destruction of the temples of Phoenicia and the extirpation of heresy in the Isle of Cyprus, extended his pastoral care to the missions of Persia and Scythia, negotiated by his ambassadors with the Roman pontiff and the emperor Honorius, and boldly appealed from a partial synod to the supreme tribunal of a free and general council. The mind of the illustrious exile was still independent, but his captive body was exposed to the revenge of the oppressors, who continued to abuse the name and authority of Arcadius. An order was dispatched for the instant removal of Chrysostom to the extreme desert of Piteus, and his guards so faithfully obeyed their cruel instructions that before he reached the sea-coast of the Euxine he expired at Comana, in Pontus, in the sixtieth year of his age. The succeeding generation acknowledged his innocence and merit. The archbishops of the East, who might blush that their predecessors had been the enemies of Chrysostom, were gradually disposed by the firmness of the Roman pontiff to restore the honors of that venerable name. At the pious solicitation of the clergy and people of Constantinople, his relics, thirty years after his death, were transported from their obscure sepulchre to the royal city. The emperor Theodosius advanced to receive them as far as Chalcedon, and, falling prostrate on the coffin, implored, in the name of his guilty parents, Arcadius and Eudoxia, the forgiveness of the injured saint. End of chapter 32, part 2. Recording by Jason Mayoff, Montreal. JasonMayoff.Voices.com